Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, and then up into the heavens, sorry, not the heavens, up into the Samawat, the parallel universes, to Sidratul Muntaha. Question, what were the signs that he saw? Have you ever asked that question? Did he come back to say, this is what I saw when I was looking at the tree? No. Did Allah say, this is what he saw when looking at the tree? No. Allah sent down the Quran, لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ He sent it down to a people who think. A people who think are a people who will ponder and reflect. <laughs> a people who will try to penetrate the subject. And if you don't plant, you will not reap. Knowledge is like that. You will not be able to connect the dots. Obviously, the answer is that he saw in the greatest of the signs of Allah he saw that which is connected with Jerusalem, connected with Masjid al-Aqsa, connected with the prophets of Allah who came to Masjid al-Aqsa, connected to Banu Israel, connected to Nabi Isa al-Islam, who was the last of them all, and who they boasted that they crucified him. But Allah says, that's what he wanted them to believe. He made it appear to them. He made it appear to them that he was crucified. So if they believe he was crucified, there's no blame on them. No. But Allah says, no, he was not crucified. You wouldn't know that. No one would know that. Not even the Pope. No one will know that. Unless and until you accept this book, the Quran, as the word of the one God, you would not know it. That no, Allah did not, they did not, they did not succeed in crucifying him. Rather, Allah raised him. And so he did not die. And Allah is going to bring him back one day. Now that is the greatest event which now remains to occur in history. That Jesus, Nabi Isa al-Islam, will return. And there are two people in the world who believe that, Muslims and Christians. And there are two kinds of Christians. There are those Christians concerning whom the Quran prohibits us from maintaining any friendly ties with them. Prohibits us. Do not take them as your friends and allies. Which Christians? Allah is talking about those Christians and those Jews who form an alliance with each other. How many times must I repeat it? When will you think? Hmm? Allah is talking about the Jewish Christian alliance. This is the Zionist alliance. Don't take them as your friends and allies. No. But the Quran speaks about another kind of Christian. Walatajidanna. You will most certainly find at this time when the Quran was revealed, and in time to come, it is fell Modaria. That there will be a Christian people, not these Christians, of course, who will be closest in love and affection to you Muslims. It happened in the time of the Prophet, Islam, the Negus of Abyssinia. Yes. And it is happening again today. The Orthodox Christians are turning to us now. Yes. The Orthodox Christians, the Orthodox Christian world is turning to us now with friendship and alliance. This is the most important event taking place in the international theater today. So these are the signs that he's being shown, something connected with this subject, the return of Jesus. Yes. 
when we ask the question, what could they have been? The Prophet came back, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he informed us in bits and pieces over a long period of time of many things which are to occur in history. And I am saying to you, this is when he got the information, when he was looking at the Sidratul Muntaha. What are the most important things that he spoke about when he came back, which constitute the greatest of the signs of Allah? What could they be? connected with Banu Israel. So let's ask the Jews. So then we'll know. When uh, Muhammad والسلام, proclaimed himself that he's a prophet of Allah, the Arabs knew him to be a truthful person. They gave him the name Al-Amin. But he says he's a prophet. So they said, let us send a delegation to that city in the north where there are lots of Jews. The rabbis were there. It was called Yatrib, now it's called Medina. And asked them, how can we tell whether or not he is indeed a prophet? The rabbis replied, and this is when they let it slip out because they're very secretive. Very secretive, eh? but they let the cat out of the bag when they said, ask him these three questions. They let the cat out of the bag when they said, ask him these three questions, which only a prophet can answer. This is the most, the most, the most important thing of all for the Jewish world. Mm. Ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. Ask him about the young man who fled into a cave, had a wondrous story. Mm and ask him about the Ruh. Ruh is spirit, Ruh. But in all English literature, they didn't use the word spirit, they used the word ghost. We know the word ghost today is uh, connected with, you know, Lagahu and Sukuya and these things, ghosts in Trinidad. But <laughs> the all English language, for spirit, they call it ghost. And uh, Nabi Isa al-Islam, Jesus, was empowered with the Holy Ghost. And we don't say the word Holy Ghost. No, we use the word Holy Spirit, al ruhul Kudus. So this is a tricky question. Ask him about the spirit, the Ruh. These are the three questions. In answering the three questions, Allah sent two answers in Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran. So we know Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran is the Surah par excellence of the end time. And then the third question about the Ruh or the Spirit, the answer came down in another Surah, Surah Al-Isra, which is the one before Surah Al-Kaf. But listen to the answer. We asalunaka an ruh and they question the O Muhammad Islam, about the Ruh. Who is questioning? The Jews. Say to them, say this to them, say only this to them, say nothing more than this to them. min amri rabbi. Say to them that the Ruh proceeds by Allah's command. But then the Quran went on to say something more. And we have not granted knowledge of this subject except a little bit. So this is a subject in which there's a limit. You must not cross that line, the limit. So we leave this subject for a while. And we go to the other two questions. When we go to the question about the great traveler, who traveled to the two ends of the earth. That question, when the Quran answered it, took us to Gog and Magog. It took us to Gog and Magog. And when they asked the question about the young man in the cave, if you read my book entitled Surah al kaf in the modern age, you see where I give the evidence. This question takes us to Dajjal. And so the Jews were questioning about the two most important,
important things of all, the signs of Allah, Dajjal and Gog and Magog. And Allah has given a warning in my, it is here in my book, uh, Jerusalem in the Quran, uh, on page uh, 162, I quoted this verse from Surah Al-A'raf. Allah is speaking to the Jews in Surah Al-A'raf. Go to the Surah Al-A'raf and go to the entire passage which culminates with verse 167. Surah Al-A'raf is the seventh, number seven, verse, Surah of the Quran. And Allah says, وَإِسْتَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُبَ الْعَذَابِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ سَرِيُّ الْعِقَابِ وَإِنَّهُ لَغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ And your Lord God has announced, he has proclaimed, that he's now going to send against them, the Jews, those who until the last day, until the day of resurrection, will inflict upon them the greatest of all punishment and suffering. Surely Allah is quick in his retribution, but he is also of forgiving and most merciful. Allah is speaking about Dajjal and about Gog and Magog in this verse of the Quran, Surah Al-Araf, verse 167. And so what Allah's messenger saw when he is looking at the tree in Isra and Miraj, the most important, the greatest, لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى What he saw, the answer is he saw the signs of Allah pertaining most of all to Dajjal and to Gog and Magog. That's what he brought back. Now let's see what he brought back in the remaining time that we have. What did he bring back with him from Isra and Miraj, which he now shares with us as the greatest of the signs of Allah? The first one I want to give to you is without doubt, without any question of a doubt, this is the greatest of all. There is nothing, nothing, nothing to compare with this as the greatest of all. You throw your staff and it becomes a snake, can't compare. You put your hand under your arm and it comes all bright and shining, can't compare. No. What is it? It is a hadith which is to be found in Sahih Bukhari. And it is repeated four times, so it is mutawatir. It is a very solid hadith and it is in harmony with the Quran. It is not just a hadith, it's a hadith al-Qudsi, meaning the direct speech of Allah, but not in the Quran. And Allah's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the day of judgment, Yawmuddin, and he speaks to Adam alayhi salam. And he says to Adam alayhi salam, take out the people for the hellfire, for Jahannam. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O Allah? Listen carefully. Because there is a profound message being conveyed in this. This is, لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى He is seeing the greatest, the greatest, the greatest of the signs of Allah in Isra and Miraj. Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O Allah, for Jahannam, for the hellfire, Jahannam? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and he says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for the hellfire. I am not going to give any tafsir of this. No, this is what he said. Out of every 1,000, Take 999 for the hellfire. Maybe you didn't hear that because nobody ever quotes it. When last did you ever hear a scholar of Islam quote this hadith? The greatest, the greatest, the greatest of all the signs of Allah. When last did you ever hear? 
one of your maulanas or your muftis or your shuyukh quote this hadith to you. Hmm? He said, Allah is speaking, hadith al-Qudsi. He said, out of every 1,000, take 999 for the hellfire, for Jahannam. Now that I've repeated it three times, you can't say you didn't hear it. No. The companions of the Prophet, والسلام, were terrified when they heard this. I would be terrified. You would also be terrified. Last night in, in Hermitage Masjid, people came from different parts of the island for that lecture, and they were terrified when they heard it last night. The Imam himself said so. It's terrifying. So the Prophet والسلام, smiled and looked at his companions and he said, good news for you. The one in a thousand for Jannah, for paradise, for heaven, will be from you. Meaning, someone who faithfully follows the truth which has come from Allah. And that truth didn't come in the Quran alone. No. But he went on to say, that the 999 would all be Ahlu Ya'juj, who are Ma'juj. And so Gog and Magog, when they are released into the world, are going to establish a global society that will take all of mankind except Illa Masha'Allah into the hellfire. A global society is going to emerge in which all of mankind are heading for the hellfire, the world order of Gog and Magog. The question which we ask is, before we ask whether Gog and Magog have been released, the question we ask is, how come a God who is merciful, who is forgiving, Ghafoor rahim Ghafoor rahim a God who is merciful, who is forgiving, who has said, tell my servants if they come to me with sins as high as the sky, I would forgive them all. Yes. One sin, however, he says, I will not forgive if you die with that sin. In the English language, they call it blasphemy. And I want to remind the Christian world about blasphemy. Yes. I remind, remind Christians about their own Christian religion today. Blasphemy. It's the one sin that the Lord God will not forgive. And in the Quran, it's the same thing. So if 999 are going into the hellfire out of every 1,000, the obvious explanation is there's only one explanation, and that is shirk or blasphemy. Shirk or blasphemy is not just worshipping an idol or worshipping gods and goddesses beside the one God. There's more to shirk than that. In Surah to Tawbah, of the Quran, Surah number 9, Allah sent down revelation in which he said, They took their priests, the Christians, and they took their rabbis, the Jews did it, as Lord and God beside Allah. They are worshipping their Christ, the Jews, worshipping their rabbis, and the Christians are worshipping their priests. And Allah declared this to be shirka. So, subhanahu amma yushrikun. Which surah is this? Surah 2? Yes, that's right. Surah 2 Tawbah. So a man came to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and asked, O Messenger of Allah, how could Allah say that the Jews are worshipping their rabbis and the Christians are worshipping their priests? They don't do that. And what was the answer? Prophet Muhammad والسلام, replied and he said, Did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is their blasphemy. That is their shirk. I hope the Attorney General of this country, Trinidad and Tobago, is listening to this talk. Because he has some lessons to learn. Did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is their shirk, blasphemy. Did the people not follow them in it? That is their shirk or blasphemy. That's the one sin Allah will not forgive. 
And so the Gog and Magog world order wants us to commit blasphemy, to sh commit shirk. Are they doing that? Oh, yes, they are. In this country, I have mentioned it several times, the government of this country has committed an act of, of extreme foolishness, stupidity. And I am 75 years of age, and I am using my language with great care. I am a senior scholar of Islam. They have committed an act of stupidity in bringing legislation that all the rest of the world have to bring it, because if you don't bring that legislation, they'll destroy your money. You will have inflation, runaway inflation, like Venezuela. That's why you have to bow down and stoop and worship the Antichrist. That's what you have to do, if you didn't know it. They brought legislation to this country that you're not allowed to get married if you're 17 years of age. No. You're not allowed. The law does not permit it. You have to be 18 to get married. That's their stupid law. But Allah has made it halal. In the Christian religion, it's halal. Ask the Roman Catholic Church. In the Christian religion, it's halal. In the Hindus, it's halal. In the Muslims, it's halal. But the government of Trinidad and Tobago makes it haram. And the South African government is making it haram. And the government of Malaysia is making it haram. And all the other governments in the world are making it haram. Well, if you are sleeping, I'm not asleep. If you make haram what Allah made halal, that is blasphemy, that is shirk. And if we accept what you have done, that also makes us committing shirk or blasphemy. Let me give you another example of why 999 out of every 1,000 in the hellfire. Allah has permitted gold and silver as money, dinar and dirham. Yes, it's there in the Quran, it's there in the Sunnah. Ask your scholars. Why are, they afraid? Why are they afraid to talk, your scholars? And they have brought, Gog and Magog have brought now paper money, and they have prohibited the use of gold as money. Yes, go to the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, and there you see it. The people who brought us and gave us this monetary system of paper money, they prohibited the use of gold and silver, gold as money, and by implication, silver. So they made haram what Allah made halal, and that is shirk. And if we accept it, if you go and ask your Maulana, go and ask your Mufti, go and ask your Sheikh, why are you silent? Ask them, is the money we're using halal or haram? Say to them, we already know that we can't do otherwise. We know we are trapped in it. That's not the question we're asking you, Maulana. The question we are asking you, Maulana, and if you have backbone, give us an answer. Is it halal, or is it haram, or is it dubious? See what answer they'll give you. The answer I am giving you is that they have made haram what Allah made halal in giving us this paper money in substitute for dinar and dirham. And that is shirk. And all of mankind have accepted it. They give fatwa that this paper money is halal. You can use this paper money to build a masjid. You could use this paper money to perform your hajj. You could use this paper money to pay your zakat. You could use this paper money to fly to Miami. Yes, I know we can't avoid it, but I want an answer. Is it halal or haram? That's the answer I'm, I'm want to getting from you. Answer, it is of course haram. It's bogus. It's fraudulent. It's haram. But we all accept it, and that is the shirk. If you don't agree with me, no problem. In the grave, of course, it'll be a different song being sung. It'll be a different tune in the grave. There'll be no smiles, there'll be no laughter, there'll be tears. Why did we not think? If we used to think, if we used to listen, we would not be in the hellfire today. So Nabi Muhammad came back from the Isra and Miraj with this as the greatest of all signs, 999 out of every 100 in the hellfire, which is why I have to devote one of my lectures to Gog and Magog once again. My students are tired. They have heard me 
so hundred thousand times they've heard me on this subject, but there are others who never heard me. So I have to give another lecture on Gog and Magog. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I have to devote another lecture to Gog and Magog to teach the subject to those who don't know. But he came back with more than that. And we don't have the time. We're running out of time now. He came back from the Isra and Mirad with lots of information on Dajjal. We know that Dajjal wants to rule the world. And we know that in order for him to rule the world, he has to do it through riba, kathra through riba in the time of Dajjal. And he'll have to do it by controlling money. And I've mentioned to you several times the hadith of uh, Sahih Bukhari about the river Euphrates and the mountain of gold. But we will not repeat it again this time because you know about it. But he came back from the Isra and Miraj to tell us some things about women and the last stage and about Dajjal. He says the last people to come out to Dajjal will be women. The last people to come out to Dajjal, the Antichrist, will be women. If you're a Christian, please listen to the word of the Prophet Muhammad. Allah's blessings be upon him. The last people to come out to the Antichrist would be women. Mm -hmm. And a man would have to return to his home and tie down or curse if re restrain his wife, his sister, to daughter to protect them from the Jal, from the Antichrist. So something is going to brainwash the world of women. Oh, yes. In the last stage. What is it? He said that women will be dressed and yet naked. This is 1,400 years ago. This is a man in the desert of Arabia who never went to school. He could not read. He could not write. And he has told us what today we are witnessing. Women will be dressed and yet be naked. He said that women will be dressed like men so that they could assume the functional role of men in society. That's why. And men will be dressed like women. And he said that there would be kathra to zina, and the majority of children born will be born of, out of wedlock, so auladu zina, bastard children. So a sexual revolution, a feminist revolution. This is what he came back with, and this is happening before our eyes today. Let us wind up now. I had to take this time to share with you my views on Isra and Mera, they're not conventional, I know, but I could not have come to these conclusions without the study of Ilmu Akhilu Zaman or Islamic eschatology, the study of the end times. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant us the time to be able to study the Quran. May grant us the nur in our hearts which we should be able to penetrate the Quran. May grant us the rational capacity to be able to connect the dots and that this Quran might be able to explain to us the strange and mysterious world in which we live today. A world in which we are now living on the very doorstep of nuclear war. We don't know whether we live to see another Ramadan. Last Ramadan, I fasted, and I thought it was the last. No more after this. If Allah allows us to see another Ramadan, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma barik lana fi shaban, wa baligna Ramadan. We pray to Allah to kindly forgive us our sins, guide us on the right path, and save us from shirk, from blasphemy, and forgive us the acts of blasphemy which we have committed knowingly, or unknowingly. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawabu rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamu rahimin. Remember, on the 21st of May, the last day of Yawmul Ahad or Sunday of uh, the month of, of, of Ramadan, of Shaban, remember the Masjid of Santa Cruz at 10 o'clock in the morning and my lecture will be on the strategic significance of the fast of Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.